Well, it looks like summer is finally here, and while I love the sound of a nice dramatic rainstorm, nothing beats going to the beach on a sunny California day. Now that I got some exercise in with this tough, vigorous workout, I'm ready to relax on the pier and start this episode. For those that have never been to California, this is Santa Monica, discovered in 1542 by Spanish conquistadors back when it was primarily inhabited by the Chumash Indians. In 1769, Spanish explorers led an expedition to the area and on a hot sunny day, such as today, came across two springs of sparkling water below the shade of some great sycamore trees. After drinking the cool water and resting in the shade, they agreed that this place should have a name. The day happened to be St. Monica's Day on the religious calendar, May 4th, and as the springs reminded them of the tears St. Monica shed for her son, Augustine, they called the area Santa Monica. In 1822, the land passed from Spanish rule to the Mexican Republic, and in 1828, Don Francisco Sepulveda was given provisional title to the area, and Sepulveda Boulevard still bears his name, one of the famous streets here that I use on my drive over the hill. Don Francisco Sepulveda's heirs sold the land in 1872 to a gold miner for $55,000. And in 1905, the town had a population of 7,208 people. The northern area of Santa Monica had become a renowned resort for the rich and famous. And by the 40s and 50s, after the Depression, the population soared to more than 83,000. As for St. Monica, she's remembered and honored in the Catholic and Orthodox churches, in part for her Christian virtues despite the suffering caused by her husband's adultery, but also for her dedication to her son, who fell ill and recovered to write about her pious acts and his life with her in his autobiographical work called Confessions. Saint Monica lived in North Africa. She was believed to be a Berber on the basis of her name, and her son Augustine had become a Manichaean at Carthage. After 17 years, he finally converted to Christianity, and it was in the grief of her passing that he was inspired to write his confessions. During the 13th century, the cult of St. Monica began to spread, and a feast in her honor was kept on May 4th. There's a statue that's erected here in her honor and while she's remembered for her tears regarding her son's early impiety, what usually is never discussed is the Manichaean philosophy to which he subscribed to for 17 years. Manichaeism was a major religion founded in the 3rd century AD by the Parthian prophet Mani in the Sasanian Empire, which is now modern Iran. It was a major religion that taught an elaborate dualistic cosmology describing the struggle between good, the spiritual world of light, and an evil material world of darkness. And when one died, they were removed from the world of matter and returned to the world of light, which is where life allegedly comes from. These beliefs are based on very ancient Mesopotamian religious movements and closely affiliated with what is more popularly known as Gnosticism. Gnosis is the Greek noun for knowledge, and the term is used in various Hellenistic religions and philosophies where it signifies a knowledge or insight into humanity's real nature as divine. The idea is mirrored in most occult philosophies, including esoteric interpretations of the Kabbalah, where divine sparks within humanity are constrained in the physicality of an earthly existence. In the Hellenistic era, the term became associated with the mystery cults. The Hellenistic period covers the time of Mediterranean history between the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BC and the true formal emergence of the Roman Empire, 
as signified by the Battle of Actium in 31 BC and the conquest of Ptolemaic Egypt. It was shortly after this when Manichaeism and similar Mesopotamian philosophies spread throughout the Mediterranean and even spread to a large part of the Roman army itself. This was one of the primary reasons that, according to some researchers, the Roman Empire made Christianity its official religion to combat and counter the influence of an ideology that was perceived to belong to its enemies. In the context of ancient Rome, some of these Near Eastern philosophies came in the form of the Mithraic Mysteries, which was a mystery religion that, like the teachings of Mani and Gnosticism, involved a personal attempt at a direct relationship with divinity, or God, and this went against the need for an authoritarian religious power structure, and so was seen as a threat to the Roman Empire, and later, the Holy Roman Empire, or the Catholic Church. While the mystery school religions were once practiced openly, worldwide, they were forced to go underground and practice in seclusion after the Roman Empire defeated the Carthaginians in what are called the Punic Wars. The Punics were Carthaginians, and another name for them were the Phoenicians, a group of people that were prominent in the ancient Mediterranean who I've already associated in prior videos with certain Egyptian dynasties and pharaohs, Israelites, and later with organizations such as the Knights Templar, and whose occult practices lives on in modern secret societies such as the Freemasons and Rosicrucians. The word Punic comes from the Latin Poinus and Poinicus, which are derived from an ancient Greek word Phoenix or Phoenix, where we also get the term Phoenicia from. It means red, and in the context of the phoenix, has to do with the mythological bird that rises from the ashes and signifies a rebirth, which was faithfully kept alive during the medieval period in the subject known as alchemy. Being reborn as light, or transmuting base physicality into spiritual gold, the ancient mystery school religions practice a sort of inner alchemy that involved sexual practices which became outlawed as they were not conducted for the sole purpose of reproduction but to awaken internal awareness and access to higher aspects of self which some interpret as gods, goddesses, demons, angels, or divinity. In the words of honorary 33rd degree Freemason Manly P. Hall, quote, the Gnostics held that the essential nature of the human is divine. They look upon men and women as gods and goddesses who have forgotten who they are. It's from this predicament that the Gnostic aspires to be freed by Gnosis. The Catholic Church did not approve, and the penalty for subscribing to Gnostic ideology was death usually by some sort of severe torture, oftentimes by being burned alive. This was the fate of the Cathars, also known as Cathari, from a Greek word meaning pure ones. They were a religious sect which flourished in between France and Spain in the 12th century in what is today known as Catalonia. Elements of organized Christianity were not alone in suppressing the old mystery religion, as organized Islam did the same with Sufi sects, which also have managed to keep pre-Islamic practices alive and incorporated into their esoteric form of Islam. Tanura means skirt. And the Tanura dance is a kind of Sufi folkloric dance which is very common in Islamic countries, especially in Turkey and in Egypt. Mm -hmm. 
This is also developed into a performance dance by non-Sufis, including dancers outside of the Islamic world, also one of the most entertaining highlights of the Dubai desert. The Tunuri beat is religious in nature and the dancer's aim is to enter a trance-like state during the performance, which they describe as reaching a spiritual inner purity and being at one with God. Another way of articulating what is happening from a more Western scientific perspective is the hypnotic music and repetitive spinning distracts and subdues the ego, allowing for a deep introspection into one's own subconscious mind. There are various ways of performing the dance where different elements of the tenura stand for various messages. As told, it is a story that connects men to the divine, a dance that refers to the relationship of land and the sky, man and God. Philosophically speaking, the spinning is from the idea that states movement in the world begins at a central point and ends up at the same point. Therefore, the movement has to be circular. The dancer usually removes four different skirts during the finale, representing the succession of the four seasons. The anti-clockwise movement mimicking the rotational direction around the Kaaba shrine in Mecca. When he turns himself around, it is said that he enters into a trance-like state, trying to become light and ascend into heaven. Whirling is magnificent to watch, but it is important to remember that the dancers are not seeking ecstasy. Instead, they enter into a hyper-conscious state and maintain their perfect physical balance. Their eyes are closed, but the dancers never touch each other, nor do they experience any dizziness. The dervishes make small, controlled, rocking movements of the hands, head, and arms as they whirl and the rotating movements are accompanied by rhythmic music dominated by the sound of the reed pipe as well as drums and some chanting as the whirling gradually transforms into a rapid spinning ecstatic move sequence. The hundreds of twirling rotations, about 20 to 30 per minute, 
coincide with the theta rhythm of the brain, combined with the chanting, makes the dancers disassociate from this reality and enter a different state of mind. Sufis represent the spiritual or mystical dimension of Islam. By the 9th century, what had originally been informal teacher-student relationships formalized with the founding of tariqas or orders, each originating from a different Sufi saint. For the Sufi, unity, or tawhid in Arabic, is a fundamental mystical experience of reality, and this truth can be experienced and known. Therefore, Sufis search for their inner soul to communicate with the divine. Sufis often use music as a source to connect with God. Although musical expression in Islam is often seen as debatable, Sufi musical performances have played an important role in creative literature and poetry. Sufi practices, including chanting, singing, dance, and meditation, are all intended to lead followers toward the experience of annihilation or fana of the ego in God. Sufism teaches that the ideal state of realization is in subsistence, or baka, wherein the mystic is conscious of both this unity and of his own individual identity. The Sufi's quest is to experience God within oneself. This is often called marifa. What is most essential to Sufism cannot be learned, but can only be reached by personal experience and inward transformation. It has been said that esoteric Sufism is intimately linked to Freemasonry and other European and Eurasian secret societies. Sabbatai Zevi was a Jewish rabbi who in 1666 declared himself to be the expected Messiah. He was a political failure having been forced to convert to Islam, but many of his followers also converted and Sabbatai Zevi has left a legacy in Turkey called the Donme, a sect of crypto or secret Jews who outwardly are Muslim yet practice ancient occult mysticism behind closed doors. Rudolf von Seppendorf was a German occultist, writer, intelligence agent, and important figure in the activities of the Thule Society, a post-World War I German occultist organization that influenced many members of the Nazi party. He was a Freemason, a Sufi of the Bektashi order after his conversion to Islam, and a practitioner of meditation, astrology, numerology, and alchemy. In his autobiographical novel, The Rosicrucian Talisman, Sabatendorf distinguishes between Sufi-influenced Turkish masonry and conventional masonry, paying extra attention to the Sufi Bektashi order in regards to their alchemical, sigil, and numerological practices. Sabatendorf established the Thule Society and then he helped to establish the DAP, or German Workers' Party. Sabatendorf later published a book called The Practice of Ancient Turkish Freemasonry, the key to the understanding of alchemy. Sabatendorf was initiated into the occult by a Jewish Masonic family in Greece, involved in banking and the silk trade, where he amassed a library of occult, Kabbalistic, Rosicrucian and Sufi texts, including meditative exercises, which are expounded on by the writings of another German occultist named Heinrich Arnold Krom Heller, who became an important figure in the spread of occultism in Latin America, settling in Mexico before moving back to Germany in 1920. He moved in elite occult circles and knew Aleister Crowley who was head of the OTO, and Rudolf Steiner, who founded the Anthroposophical Society. The German nationalist government confiscated Krumheller's library, but did not arrest him. While the Nationalist Party was hostile towards Freemasonry, 
and all occult secret societies for that matter, it was not because they felt the occult knowledge was invalid, but because they did not want competition and internalized all of the accumulated esoteric material into their own secretive occult programs, which expanded on the foundations established by esoteric groups such as the Vril Society, headed by mystic Maria Orsic, which researched and practiced ancient rituals which stemmed from the mystery school religions. While many of these ancient practices were originally meant to advance man spiritually, after World War II, the esoteric knowledge has been kept secret and exploited, suppressing not only advances in technology and free energy, but a deeper understanding of mankind's true potential. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you could do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those that are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your comments. So please leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you again soon.